Okay, Jeff, hi. Uh, it's a long time ago that we've seen each other. Um, I think one of the reasons, of course, that we're talking is that these days you're also a famed writer and publisher of a book. Yeah, and, and I'd like to start off with one of the quotes in the book that I found sort of uh, really, really interesting is that the shift from build versus buy is shifting to build versus die. Yeah, and so we're basically you you make the case that that if companies don't become digital builders, they're most likely to buy. So die. So can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like you start to see in every industry, like every industry, it used to be that, you know, companies thought of IT and, and software as like this, oh, it's this back of house thing. It was the, you know, how you ran the financials of the company, or it was the, you know, IT was about the laptops for the employees and making sure the printers had paper. And, you know, in that world, it was like, usually you wanted to, you know, it was a cost center. So you wanted to spend less, you wanted to outsource it. And look, 20 years ago, you know, that, that made sense, right? And I remember it was like classic, the classic question in that world was always like, oh, build versus buy. And like, you needed a, you know, whatever, you need the HR software updated. And then be like, oh, do we build or buy that? And, you know, a vendor would come in and say, well, clearly you should buy the HR solution. And they'd say, you don't want to reinvent the wheel and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, look, the vendors were usually right. And so you'd end up just buying a big piece of software and implementing it you know, at the end of the day. But over the last 20 years, what's happened is that the software has moved from the back office, you know, all the just this you know, cost centery stuff. And it's moved into the to the to front of house. It's moved to be the thing that you use to, to differentiate yourself in the eyes of your customer. Like think about your bank, right? It used to be your bank. If you walked, you know, you, you walked in the front door of a physical building and if it had a nice, you know, new paint job and the uh, teller was friendly and they gave your kid a lollipop, you'd say, okay, well, I like my bank. Nowadays, think about your bank. It's an app on your phone. And you like your bank if the app is easy to use, if it gets new features to make your life easier. By the way, if the app doesn't crash, those are the things that lead you to say, I like my bank. And so as software has moved from the back of house to the customer facing functions, it's become the point of differentiation. And the thing that happens in every industry is, you know, there's like the status quo and then along comes usually some sort of digital disruptor, like a startup who's really good at building software. And they build this amazing experience and customers start taking notice. And the interesting thing about that digital disruptor is they're builders of software. So what's their core thing that they do is they listen to customers. They hear about the big unsolved problems that customers have and they go build those and then build the answers to those problems. The industry turns to uh, builders of software and you literally get this Darwinian type, type evolution, which is the companies that can adapt the quickest to changing customer needs and compete on that front. Those are the companies that win the hearts, minds and wallets of customers. And the companies that can't do that, that aren't agile, that can't listen to customers and execute for customers, well, they start to die off. And that's where you get this idea that it's no longer build versus buy, it is build versus die. Because if you're unable to listen to your customers and execute on a roadmap to serve your customers better than your competition, well, eventually you're just going to go the way of the dodo. Yeah, yeah, it, it is though, I think in the earlier days of digital transformation, the whole notion was to go, we need to become digital because there's all these younger businesses that are starting to eat our lunch because it can move faster and all these kind of things. But it still was a sort of survival kind of thing. Yeah, and you notice it in the book as saying, no, it's not about survival, it's about succeeding. Because it's not just an idea about that you need to go digital, you need to go digital because you can serve your customers better. Yeah, and because only thinking about the competition, oh, we need to do this too, because the competition is doing this, that but still doesn't change the mindset of the leaders in the company to become customer centric. Yeah, that's interesting, right? In some ways, you know, digital does require you to, to adopt a different way of thinking about your customers, because more than ever, like in a, in a physical, like bricks and mortar type world, like you really relied on, you know, people. Uh, to be customer centric. And so like, you know, going back to my banking example, if the bank teller was, was, you know, well-trained and was the right kind of mentality to serve customers, then, you know, the customer had a good experience. But in a digital world where you're touching millions and even some companies, billions of people through software, it really requires your roadmap and your, your, innovate, your innovation thinkers and your product thinkers and your engineers to all be customer focused 
instead of just what you might think of in the old world as your frontline uh, workers. And so it really is a cultural shift inside of companies for how you build, how you prioritize, and how you keep all of those functions in the company close to the customer. And one of the things that I observed like through building Twilio is that in the very early days of Twilio, like, you know, when we were five employees, you know, like I might in any one day, you know, uh, write some code, design a product, do customer support, do sales and pay the bills, right? And in that universe, like you've got the whole picture of like the whole company. And in fact, the customer's needs translated all the way back into the code you're writing, like it's all in your head. And what's interesting is as a company grows, what happens? You know, you, you hire a sales team because you want the sales team to specialize in selling and you hire a support team who's going to specialize in supporting your customers. You hire an engineering team who specializes in engineering and via a lot of good intentions, you build up these silos of people who are specialists. And the unintended consequence of that is you end up isolating a lot of your company from customers they're trying to serve. Because what happens, like in the early days of the company, I'm an engineer, I'm running code, and I'm also doing customer support. And eventually you say, oh, well, you know, let's, let's let the engineers focus their time on writing code and let's not bother them with customers so that they can actually focus on doing their job. And so with these good intentions, you put up walls between the people who are serving customers and the people who are actually building for customers. And so I think one of the things that I talk about in the book is how you have to be very intentionally poke holes in those walls. And like, look, I'm not saying you want your engineers doing customer support 24 seven, but, <laughs> but if you perfectly execute this world of like siloed and, and protect your developers from all this stuff, what you end up with is they're really disconnected from the customer they're serving. And so you have to be really smart about how do you, how do you create that? In fact, one of the key roles in doing that, I believe is the product manager. And a lot of product managers, I believe internalize their role as protecting their team from the distractions of customers, whether it's via the sales team, the support team, or directly with customers. Yet I think the best product managers are those that see their role as facilitating the right interactions between their team and the customer that they are to serve. And I think that that is a, a really something that product managers can internalize to actually make sure that their teams are very customer focused. And I also talk a lot about small teams. And this is something that I, I learned during my time at Amazon, right? And so I think the goal as you build a company is to try to continually maintain that sense of urgency and that closeness to the customer and the mission that you have when you are an early stage startup. And the way you do that is by continually subdividing the company down into small teams. And small teams of give or take 10 people, and the way we define those small teams is with a mission, like why do they exist, a customer that are there to serve, internal or external, and metrics that define whether or not they're serving that customer. And kind of once you align on this idea of like the mission, the customer, and the metrics, now you've actually unleashed that team to really sprint every day and to really own that problem, that mission, and serve that customer by, um, by having that full like you know, intrinsic drive that you have in the early days of a startup. And I think that's one of the key things to really scaling a company, but keeping that urgency and that intensity and that, um, that intrinsic drive, making it personal so that people really want to do their best work. Yeah, and, and ownership plays a very important role in that, of course. It's the way that you hire people. Yeah, and I think uh, the Amazon leadership principles are, are of course, I mean, when you and I joined Amazon, there were 10, now there are 14. Yeah, but the first two, I mean, customer obsession is, of course, is, is obvious. I mean, Amazon tries to be the, the Earth's most customer-centric company. And the fun thing is, indeed, if you still ask people now, we're now well over a million employees. Yeah, if really thinks, oh, the Earth's most customer-centric company, that's just a marketing gig. Yeah, no, I mean, after three months at Amazon, this is what you live and breathe. But I think the second one, you know, ownership, hiring people that really want to own the problem, and I think without sort of having and the small teams come in there, so they can be owners. And they don't have to worry about the big picture. They have to worry about their piece. And I think as such, I think ownership is, is equally important in all of that, for hiring people that want to be owners of their little world. You know, and I find that when you've got small teams, like a few good things happen. You know, first of all, in a small team, everyone's got to pull their weight. You know, you can't have a low performer hanging out on a small team of 10 people. It's really obvious. 
And it's not fair to everyone else on the team. And so people really have high expectations of each other. And, you know, versus like a world where, oh, like, you know, but my, my, my division is, you know, 300 people and I'm just one of the cogs in the machine. It's like, it's really easy for someone to kind of get checked out and just keep floating along in that world. Whereas a small team, no one can do that. The other thing I think is interesting about small teams, which kind of goes along with the notion of those small teams are led by what we call a single threaded leader. They wake up every day and they only care about succeeding at this thing in the company. That's like the ownership model. And so when the leader who's, who, who's the owner, who makes the decisions, who can make the, the tough decisions is really close to that team. You don't get this inner, you don't get this dynamic where it's like, well, you know, this seems pretty stupid, but somebody far away in the org chart made this decision and now we have to implement it. Like, oh, you know, whatever. It's like, no, like if you disagree with the decision, it's probably your manager who who maybe made the, the tie-breaking call and you can just challenge it and you can discuss it and you or you can disagree and commit, right? Um, but it's not like somebody far away who is anonymous, whose name I just know because they have a VP title made some decision and now I have to go do it. It's like, no, this is ours. This is our decision. And so I think there's a sense of like how close you are to the decision maker is directly impactful for how much you buy into the decisions and how much you believe in the execution, therefore, that comes from it. Um, and so I love that, that idea that like decisions are made locally and therefore you can own those decisions. Uh, and it's interesting, of course. I mean, we, we're both living in digital native companies yeah, or, or software we're, we're technology companies, even though Amazon looks like a retailer to most people, but it's a technology company. What are structures that you advise to, let's say, the more traditional companies, how to change their ways? Yeah, because I think that's sort of, I mean, starting from scratch is one thing. Yeah, that's nice. It's a luxury. But, you know, with these really large conglomerates or very large companies that want to change their ways. How, where, where do they start? That's a great question. And one that I, I talk about with, with leaders all the time who are, who are struggling to make that transition. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the way I think about it is starting small. You know, one of the neat things about this small team approach means that your unit of execution and your, your unit of, of progress here is like staff your first small team. And you're not talking about, oh, I have to hire a thousand people and, you know, and, and open a, an R&D center in Silicon Valley. It's like, no, you just have to hire 10 people. And in fact, even that can sound daunting, but all you, have to, all you really have to do is hire your first leader, hire your first single threaded leader. You know, I, I tell the story in the book of Domino's Pizza. And Domino's Pizza is this sleeper success story. Like, look at the stock market, look at their stock price. In fact, they've outperformed many tech companies over the past decade because they have transformed from a pizza company into a technology company. And it really started when the CEO, Patrick Doyle, about 10 years ago, realized, like he woke up and he said, huh, you know, all these new food delivery companies, like they're going to literally and figuratively eat our lunch if we don't actually become as good at technology as all these other companies who are now willing to deliver food from like every restaurant out there. And so he set out to hire the leader and, you know, and he hired this leader named Kevin to lead the charge. And it was interesting. I talked to Kevin, they're a customer of Twilio's. And I talked to Kevin about that process. He said, you know, I actually originally took the interview, like took the meeting. I had no intention of joining a pizza company. Uh, I was just kind of doing, a, you know, someone a favor to like take the meeting. But here's what Patrick Doyle said. He said, look, Kevin, Domino's, this company has been around for 50 years. We have to transform into becoming a technology company or else we're dead. And I want you to lead the charge. I want you to be the person who I'm going to trust at my right hand side, who's going to really take Domino's into the future and be the best at technology, not just in like the pizza field, not just in rapid service, but like of all the food options that anybody has, Domino's has to be the best. And, and uh, Kevin was like, Wow, like what a mission that is. Like, you know, I can go, let, let's say someone could go work at, you know, one of the big tech companies, you know, you're kind of gonna be a, a small fish in a big pond, but if you're a, like a, a, a company that's been around for hundred years and you're literally saying like, look, the legacy of this company is getting written right now. And whether we're even in business in 10 years is like an existential question and technology leader, I wanna trust you to do it. What a mandate that is. So I think it starts with hiring, hiring your first leader and telling that story of big impact. And then the second thing is, what's that leader gonna do? Well, they have to start small. Hire that first team. Start with a customer, a mission, and the metrics of one area where you're gonna to innovate to start. 
And at Domino's, the challenge that Patrick gave that team, he said, he had this realization. He said, you know, it seems to me like um, a lot of busy parents are in their commute home from work and they realize they didn't, they don't know what's for dinner tonight. If someone could order dinner from a stoplight, then we could be the preferred way the busy parents feed their kids. And so he gave them a challenge. He said, can you make it so, so a busy parent can order, uh, order dinner during the amount of time you're stopped at the red light? And that simple observation, that simple challenge he posed to that team gave them years of innovation that was mobile apps and Alexa integrations and even ordering pizza with a text message. And they had to build a whole CRM system because they had to store your preferences. So you didn't have to like enter your address every time. And you think about what it used to be, you'd call the store and you have to read your address again and again and order it. Like if you want to order it in 20 seconds, like we need to know your address. We need to know your favorite pizzas. And you basically say reorder. And so that gave them years of roadmap. And so that one small observation was the starting point to them building out even the pizza tracker, which everybody talks about now, the pizza tracker, that came from the quick, am I going to get home before the pizza is or not, right? Um, and so start small. And it's interesting, I actually talked to Jeff Immelt, uh, who you mentioned is the, the, the CEO of GE or was the CEO of GE, who's now a Twilio board member. And you know, I talked to him about his attempt to steer that ship. And that's an enormous ship to have to steer in a new direction. Um, and what he would have done differently now in retrospect. And you know what he said? He said, you know what I did? I started big because I believed that, you know, for this huge company, the way to steer it was to make big bets and big proclamations. So I invested half a billion dollars and we opened the big R&D center in Silicon Valley. And I hired a bunch of these big leaders. And you know what? And we made one big bet, in this industrial IoT platform thing. Yep. And, and you know what? Like it didn't work out. And what I now realize is that I should have started small. What I should have done is instead of funding one giant team with one giant mission, if I had funded 10 small teams with 10 different ideas, then you know, our chances of success would have gone up yep. because we would have had 10 shots at goal, not one. And by the way, I would have spent a 10th the amount of money. And then when I found the one that was working, then we could have poured the resources into it. And so I think the other th piece of advice that I give a lot of leaders who are undergoing this thing, which is have an experimental mindset. Because we're literally at the vanguard of technology and business, right? Inventing this future. And nobody knows the answers to like, what is going to be the next big thing in technology? Like, it's not like, this isn't knowable. Um, we are all inventing this in real time. And so what you need to do is have a lot of shots on goal. So have an experimental mindset. And so every new area that you enter, start small have a hypothesis that you're trying to prove or disprove, and then measure the progress about proving or disproving a hypothesis. And by the way, reward the people who do the work and realize that that business idea is a bad idea. Customers yeah. don't want it. Okay. You know, a lot of, in a lot of businesses, you're like, you failed. Customers don't want this thing. No, that's not failure. If they learned that lesson cheaply and inexpensively and quickly, that's progress. Learning something customers don't want is just as valuable as learning something they do want. Yeah. So it's like, those are some of the things I advise leaders to, to do in order to create an environment of innovation and one where teams can move fast. Yeah, I remember actually Jeff, in, Jeff Bezos in his uh, first letter to shareholders. I mean, the second line in, in sort of the definition of the company is experiment, measure, learn. And learn from failure is equally, if not more important than, than learning from from success you know because and so it's also i see i see this happening in many of the traditional companies failure basically means an attack on your career within the company where the hierarchy becomes more important than sort of the progress which means that you'll wait a long time before you pull the plug on a project yeah or on an experiment because it will be a failure so coming back to measurements and metrics what is the importance of all of that well, I think, you know, the hard thing is if you don't have a scorecard, um, it's, you, you, a, you can't have accountability. And like, that's kind of well known, right? But the more interesting thing isn't like having metrics, because a lot of companies have metrics. It's which metrics to track. And so when you're trying to innovate, you shouldn't be measuring those early stage projects by things like revenue, right? Because revenue is a later stage outcome. That's an output metric. What you really should start looking at is input metrics. And I always think, you know, Eric Reese, uh, who wrote the forward for my book, uh, and his, he's a, uh, you know, New York Times bestselling author for his books, The Lean Startup and, and the others. Um, you know, he talks about innovation accounting, which is like when you start a new project, 
you have essentially a spreadsheet that is a model of like what you think is going to happen. So let's say you have an idea for a new product. You're going to build a model probably before you fund it that says, well, if we succeed here, this is the path to making a you know, hundred million dollars. And there's assumptions built into that model. There's assumptions about, oh, well, we're going to have, you know, like a, a, we're going to have a thousand customers or we're going to have, we're going to have a million customers each paying us a hundred dollars a year. Great. So the first step to validating that model is checking whether those assumptions are, are likely to be true. And so can I find one customer to pay me hundred dollars a month or hundred dollars a year? If I can't find one, that's probably a bad sign. Let's say you find one, you might also wanna validate, great, are there a million such customers out there in the world? And you do research to try to answer that question. And if you validate uh, the assumptions that went into the model of why you're embarking on a business um, endeavor, that is the key ingredients to actually saying, is this endeavor likely to succeed? So instead of uh, starting an endeavor and then a year later being like, what, this thing's only making, you know, $500,000, this is stupid, shut this off, which, you know, at big companies, everyone talks about needle moving this and that. And obviously to move the needle at a company with a lot of revenue, it's got to be a big number, but you can't expect that to happen overnight. But if anybody knew what was going to be the needle moving thing on day one, of course, you'd only invest in those things. But the reality of the world is that nobody knows on day one which is gonna be the big needle moving idea. So instead you have to have a very um, uh, experimental mindset and one where you're looking at those early metrics as predictors of future success and future realization of the assumptions that you had in your early business plan. And like, that's the key thing to look at. And I, you know, so many times, even at Twilio, I've seen this behavior where it's like, hey, this early thing, it's not making a, you know, a ton of revenue yet. What's the deal with that? Maybe we should kill that. And it's like, whoa, 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 slow down. Like revenue at this stage of the idea, it's not about revenue. It's about validating the assumptions. And so really it's having the right metrics to look at in the early stages of a product's life cycle in order to predict and extrapolate out. Do we think that we've proven the right things to say that five years from now, this will be the needle moving thing, but the early indicators of it are different. It's like, you know, if you, you know, there's an analogy, like if you, if you don't plant a seed, you're never going to get a tree. Mm -hmm. But when the seed starts growing, of course, it's not yet a tree. It's a little sapling, right? And you can't look at the sapling and be like, you're a stupid tree and step on it. No, you have to water it. You have to give it sunlight. Like that's how you're going to get a tree. And the same thing goes with innovation. Yeah. Anyway, I think we're, we're almost out of time, Werner. What didn't we that's get fine. to? <laughs> well, probably tons of it. I mean, I forgot to, to talk about sort of the importance of operations versus development. And uh, where, I mean, software needs to be, the, the time you develop software versus the time that you actually run and operate it is, is, this, those are out of, not out of whack. I mean, it's small, time, development time is actually very small to the operations time. Yeah. And so I think it's not just about developers, it's actually also having a culture where developers operate. Yeah, whether we call it DevOps or HugOps or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think the operation, indeed, what you mentioned earlier, if you have to build these silos where the operators are sitting somewhere else, developers throw their software over the wall and suddenly the operators become their customers not the end customer. And yeah, so the importance of having the small teams also operate their software, because after all, that's almost the most important part of the software that it can be operated and can be managed and maintained. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'll just close with an observation that because of the sophistication of software and um, you know, the programming languages that are out there and the tool chains that are out there, writing software is easier than ever. But because of the scale of the internet, operating that software is harder than ever. And that's why the value of this software supply chain is, is so great. Companies like AWS or Twilio that don't just give you software and like, here you go, run it yourself, who actually operate it for you at internet scale with high SLAs and security and everything else that goes along with the challenges of operations, make it so your teams can focus on the building and not have to focus as much energy on the operating. And that the value of that has actually unlocked so much ability for companies to execute at internet scale who don't actually have the, the need or the desire to actually spend all those cycles figuring out, all right, how do we even just scale it? How do we keep the thing up? How do we make sure it's secure? You know, relying on the software supply chain that has grown up to enable every company to be great builders and operators of software is so critical. Yeah, yeah I actually think if I look at, at AWS, one of the biggest drivers for larger enterprises to move to banking and others to move to the uh, to move to AWS is security. I mean, 
the, the threat models have changed dramatically over the past years. And larger companies start to realize that they can't make those investments. Yeah, and that there's others that can make those investments for them. And as such, you know, Trilio and AWS become successful companies in helping them achieve that. Well, and it's interesting in this software supply chain companies like AWS, Twilio, Stripe is another one for payments. Uh, you know, we are some of the fastest growing companies in the history of software. And it's interesting because a lot of people think of software as apps, but actually the infrastructure companies, the ones that are enabling every company to get good at software and technology um, is turns out to be a great business for, for us, but also one that is so needed by every company in the world, it's really the pull of every company feeling the need to get really good at the things that we can help them do. That is when I think one of the biggest trends that's going on in business today. And that's in many ways, that's why I wrote the book, Ask Your Developer, is like how to unleash the talents of those developers, how to create that culture of innovation, and how to actually build and use the right infrastructure to enable yourselves to compete in this digital world. Okay, Jeff, thanks for the conversation. And you know, wish you lots of luck with the book and looking forward to your next book. Thank you very much, Werner. Appreciate it. And thank you everybody for listening in.